today we'll be focused on spectroscopy and we've been asking ourselves what exactly is molecular spectroscopy and we'll be focused on three types of this spectroscopy and that is infrared or vibration spectroscopy mass spectroscopy and nuclear magnetic resonance uh, the two nuclei we're concerned about are the protons and the carbon 13s. Um, you can see here, for example, we have a molecule pi pi star, so it's a pi system. And you can imagine there's an energy difference here, and that energy difference equals to delta E equals to H nu, where H is Planck's constant and nu is the frequency of light. So if you imagine hitting this molecule with this particle of light, then those two electrons in the ground state will be excited yeah, and you would have promotion of one electron to pi star. This promotion realizes absorption of that H norm. So we got to associate um, this particle of light, yes, uh, with also the wavelength uh, related to that light because of Einstein's wave particle duality. Uh, there's not a lot that we can do with that light except we can reflect it, absorb it, or emit it of some sort, yes? So it's all to do with some type of absorption, all right? And the absorption of said molecule, yes, will tell us what the content of that molecule is. So you can see here, um, Associated with that wave is, of course, the wavelength. And, of course, associated with that same species, that light is the frequency, as we stated before. And Planck's constant, of course, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 seconds. There is a direct proportionality between energy and frequency. And there is an inverse proportionality with wavelength. You can see yeah, that we can classify this radiation, we can classify it spectral, so from X-ray all the way through to radio, we can classify it spectroscopically, and of course we're looking at such electronic spectra, or vibration spectra, and spin, and of course we can look at applications such as uh, that to do with absorption spectroscopy, and so photochemistry, photosynthesis, and therapeutics, for example. You can see here the electromagnetic spectrum, right? And you can see there is an inverse proportionality between wavelength and frequency, and a direct proportionality between frequency and energy, right? So as we increase energy, we increase frequency and you can see there's a decrease in wavelengths. Look carefully, this tiny sliver here belong to the visible and of course below the visible we have infrared and above we have ultraviolet. Note yeah, um, that herein yeah, we can ask ourselves simple questions such as which is the highest in energy. That's quite simple to figure out. What I would have asked in an exam would be yeah, to rank um, these energies. And so here we can look at the regions and look at the energy transitions involved. And you can see the ones that we're concerned with, ultraviolet would be electronic, infrared is vibrational, and of course radio is nuclear and electronic spin. Where is mass spec? The reason why mass spec is absent from here because that's not a true spectroscopic technique and we'll be looking at that later. Exactly. So let's look at vibration spectroscopy, also known as infrared spectroscopy, and that's to do with the vibration of bonds. It can be either bending or yes, stretching vibrations. 
right? We use these to identify functional groups in the molecule. Um, we can either do this uh, qualitatively, do spectral matching, or we can do quantitative analysis yeah, via absorption that will give us yeah, things like concentration, etc., etc. You can see this is an infrared spectrum. In the x-axis, you can see that we have a frequency scale called wave numbers. Not exactly linear. And then, of course, you can see that there is difference in intensity of these bands. Right? In the y-axis, we have transmittance. Transmittance, of course, is, the, is inversely proportional to absorption. So here we're increasing absorption. At the same time, we have strong absorption. We have low transmissions. Make sense? Right. The shape is also important because you can see this is very broad and strong. So the intensity is strong. The shape is broad. Here we have its medium and it's sharp. Yeah. It's weak here and sharp. Yeah. It's fairly weak here and sharp. Fairly weak but broad. And so on. These are the type of stretching that you have. You can see it can be symmetric or asymmetric, and you can also bend and in plane or out of plane. So these are the types of vibrations that you'll see in your spectrum. Fortunately for us, a lot of these energies that um, we absorb for these type of vibrations are equal, yeah, or in the same region, and so yeah, um, we do not have to elucidate uh, too many lines. Why we take a quantum mechanical approach to this work and we look at the bond yeah uh, we can look at a typical diatomic molecule yeah as a spring yeah connecting the two nuclei so we can therefore use Hooke's law realize that with a spring you're compressing and stretching with a force constant and of course there's a difference in the distance yeah every time you stretch and compress and of course we're looking at the two different masses m1 and m2 this is the equation associated with uh, an, an harmonic species because remind yourself right that the simple harmonic yeah is this curve and the actual molecules and harmonic but we can use a simple harmonic to describe exactly what we're working with um, do not get um, too concerned about this because if you notice carefully right there is this constant which is just a couple of numbers we can just get rid of that we don't know if we can ignore that this here means a square root so we can yeah easily get rid of that for the time being and then once you sort of reduce it you can see that the frequency is directly proportional to the force constant i.e the frequency is directly proportional to the strength of the bond so as you increase bond strength then of course you will increase the frequency you can also see that frequency is inversely proportional to the reduced mass and the reduced mass looks a bit complex but it's not because think about it for a second the reduced mass is really the product of the two masses divided by the sum of the two masses I want you to compare carbon hydrogen to carbon deuterium which deuterium is chemically equivalent to hydrogen this is of course mass 12 um, let's get rid of that this is very naughty twelve this is one this is twelve that's two so the product here for CH is twelve for CD of course is twenty-four the sum m1 plus m2 is 13 here and for the cd it's 14. you can see that the 
denominators are not much difference and so therefore note therefore that we can easily state that the frequency is inversely proportional to the mass so here you can see that yeah that the larger the mass yeah then of course the greater yeah the so let me repeat that uh, realize that the larger the mass then of course the lower the frequency you can see here where we have the higher uh, the larger the force constant ie the bond strength then of course the lower the frequency so so to let me repeat that the larger the bond strength then the higher the frequency make sense so herein we're looking at the four primary regions of the infrared spectrum and i want you to focus on the oh and hch so these are the, the atoms attached to the hydrogen and then of course the triple bonded region which is in the 2000 region and the double bonded region which around centered around 1600 1600 um, below that of course um, we will have uh, the fingerprint region and the fingerprint region we're not really concerned about in this course you can see here a summary of um, some hydrocarbons here we're looking at the alkenes alkenes and alkynes and what you need to do here is draw a line yeah at 3000 and see exactly what's to the left of it you can see here the alkenes the vanillic ch will appear as a splinter and then of course the alkalinic um, species will appear uh, stand alone um, of course there is a difference because of the bond strength think about exactly what increases the strength of the alkyne CH you can see there can be intensities differences as well one difference here yeah, is due to the dipole the stronger the dipole the larger the dipole the stronger the intensity so if you compare the carbon out to the alkene you can see exactly why So herein you can see that um, looking here at a regular alkane you can see the CH uh, centered around 3000 just below 3000 there is here you can see there is broadening of uh, the bond compared to uh, when you have hydrogen bonding and of course if it's a molecule in the gas phase then of course we'll also have sharper signals and herein you can see for example the OH yeah, which has hydrogen bonding yeah, is quite broad while the alkyne CH quite sharp look at the NH's for both the secondary and primary amines these are fairly broad but weaker because they're not that polar and of course yeah 
you can see there is a difference between the secondary and the primary. And look at the vanillic CH and the aromatic CH. You can see that once we go beyond 3000, then of course you can see that splinter. Yeah, it's due to this one thing here. Analyzing the IR spectrum, yeah, we'll be looking at the hydrocarbons. Actually, we just probed them a while ago. And then we can look at, say, for example, the alcohol, which is have dihydrogen bonding. We look at the carbonyls, of course, so the aldehyde ketones and carboxylic acids. And of course, we'll look at this guy here, which is in the sugar bonded region, and amines. So you can see, we just looked at the octane. All we can see here is that CH, so it's significant to us. But with the alkene, you can see the CH here is quite uh, it's a medium peak and it's quite sharp uh, on the other hand the CH of the, the species so this was a C double bond CH I should say but you can see that the CH, the CH itself yeah is just beyond the 3000 yeah all right as a splinter look at the alkyne yeah, you can see there's two peaks. This is a terminal alkyne, by the way. For some reason, infrared can't see internal alkyne. But terminal alkyne, you can see that the C triple bond C is in the triple bonded region, 2000s. And of course, the CH, of course, beyond is way beyond the 3000. You see, it's 3000, so it's here around 3200. For the alcohol, you can see the OH again beyond 3000, but this time around it's fairly broad. Fairly broad, and it's fairly strong because not only is it quite polar, yeah, but of course um, it is uh, hydrogen bonding. The carbonyl, of course, is very polar. And it isn't it's going to be in the C double bond or MC double bond. It's going to be in the double bonded region. In this case here, it's in around 1710. You can't miss it. So, for example, you can see here with um, the aldehyde, you can see this CH. It's really, a weird, it's a re really at a weird place. But what's more important is this C double bond. Uh, centered around 1700. Ketones on the other hand does not have a CH so there's no CHs in this region here but of course we can see that C double bond though. Very intense yeah, in the double bonded region. You can see here the carbonyl. The carbonyl also has that C double bond O but along with that C double bond O we have of course the OH but for reasons we're probing later on, in um, later chapters, we'll see that the carboxylic acid the, has extensive hydrogen bonding, and because of that, the OH is much broader. See, it's centered around 3000, but it's much broader than the alcoholic OH. The nitriles, of course, yeah, similar to the C triple bond C, yeah, sits in the triple bonded region, yeah, 2100. But of course, it's a little bit more polar than a alkyne, and so therefore, you'd expect it to be a bit more intense. So ask yourself, what functional group do we have here? First of all, we'd have to look, yeah, and um, look at exactly what's going on. You can see, uh, um, if you look beyond 3000, there's nothing, right? So it can't be an alcohol. If you look in the triple bonded region here, 2000s, there is no straight, so that's not an alkyne. So yeah, you can see for carboxylic acid, of course, you'd expect something to be in the, the to be an OH, intense OH, 
that's not existing so that's out as well and so we're left with these guys here because this is in the um, the double bonded region however note yeah that this is a very intense peak it's a very strong peak and so this can't be a C double bond C it is definitely a ketone make sense so always analyze the fingerprint region the, the fingerprint well we're not analyzing the fingerprint region actually we should not say that sorry about that we should analyze the functional group region as well the functional group region and look for double bonds or triple bonds and then look for anything that's bonded to hydrogen and draw a line here yeah, at 3000 and probe exactly what's to the left of it right then of course analyze the intensity in the shape of the bands so for example here you can see that we looked at 6000 region we see we got stuff going on right and of course we looked at the triple bonded region there was nothing and if you look at the XH region you can see at 3000 there is this fellow here and so we know we have some sort of alkene what about this one immediately you can go 3000 here you will see immediately there is this fellow here right and so it tells you there's alcohol because there's no nothing going on in the both the double bonded region or the triple bonded region just above 3000 we see it's broad peak what about this one yeah in the double bonded region we see something there's nothing in the triple bonded region and there's nothing above 3000 so what we're left with is at an alkene or a carbonyl and you realize that this is very 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 strong peak so it has to be a carbonyl so the only thing that we can think of right now is the pentanone note we have a nitrogen yeah and here you can see in the triple bonded region we have some sort of stretch so we immediately know we have a nitrile so we can draw uh, various um, species that associated with this guy all right limitations of the infrared yeah you can see that we cannot determine the structure on its own it's quite difficult we can elucidate some functional groups but it's really tough yeah because some of the signals are ambiguous yeah and the absence of a signal is proof that the functional group is absent hmm? all right so what we need to do is we need to go to another technique and this is mass spectrometry mass spec the true sense of the word is not a but the true a pure spectroscopic technique yeah because it's not like we're using light to interrogate matter here's what we do right and yeah we can use this by the way to number of um, uses as you can see here we can talk about these in class um, but what we have is we have an ionization source in this case here we're looking at electron ionization mass spectrometry and we um, so we have uh, we're looking at this fellow here this one so we have an ionization source and then of course um, we ionize our molecule place it in the analyzer and then of course we can detect it later on down the road so here in our case we have um, our sample yeah introduced into a vacuum chamber and of course we provide the electrons which slam into our sample so accelerated by these magnets into our sample and then of course the sample itself 
yeah the fragments of the sample is yes accelerated down this tube and then bent by this magnetic field the deflection yeah that occurs is determined by the mass of uh, charge and it's kind of hard to get a plus two charge in mass spec usually we get a plus one charge so most of these peaks are due to the yeah the mass of those fragments so the compound is vaporized and ionized and then the masses of the ions are detected and graphed how does it work we have an electron spanking an atom a molecule sorry and then of course the molecule gets excited and you can see that it loses an electron so now we have a positively charged species what we call a charged radical yeah and in this case here this is the this is the molecular ion this one is the molecular ion so in this case it's M plus and you can see fragmentation starts to occur in this case here we lost a radical um, and in one atom and we're left with this species so this is an n minus one peak you can see also here right we lost yeah this fragment so this is an m this species here is an m minus 15 peak meaning the molecular mass minus 15 mass units here in you can see we have other compounds so for example yeah we can see here we have the pro pill species and pro pill is quite interesting because you can see that yeah, we have n minus 15 here, we got n minus 29 here, and of course we have the molecular ion itself here. Yeah, but we have some interesting thing. Here's the n minus one, and here we got an n plus one. We'll talk about these in a second. So only the cations are deflected by the magnetic field. Yeah, and the deflection depends on the m over z. So herein, yeah, we have a molecule, this is benzene, and we can see that the highest peak is also the molecular peak at m over z equals to 78. However, if you look closely, you can see that, yeah, 93.4% of all the molecule is, of course, that due to, yeah, the highest abundant isotopes of carbon and hydrogen while you have a another species 6.5 percent of the species is one that has carbon 13 present and of course you can see 0.1 would have a deuterium so you can imagine that 6.6 percent .6 will be a m plus one peak see 6.6 percent of your sample would be m plus one herein you can see for example if we look in the decay lies we have these m plus two peaks and and the m plus two peaks is a three to one ratio for chlorine because yeah in this case here you can see that the chlorine yeah, has a three to one abundance 35 relative to 37 the bromine on the other hand you can see a one to one peak yeah of the 79 to 81 yeah because those are approximately 50 50. you can see loss of the halide realizes yeah the 77 peak so that that fragmentation here same thing here see 
So loss of the 35p equals 37 p realizes the m equals m over z equals to 77 mass units. Look at this one. This is the species that has a benzyl carbon. And the fragmentation takes place. And so you'd expect our fragment to be um, the benzyl cation, which is 91. But the benzyl itself rearranges to give us a very stable fragment in the chamber. And this fragment is called the tropillium ion. It's a seven membered ring with six electrons in that ring. Yeah. All right. All the carbons are sp2 hybridized this is an aromatic species and we'll be looking at that later on so this is your molecular ion here at 120 but note the base peak i.e the most abundant peak 100 percent relative intensity is at 91 For alcohols, you can see that in this case here, alcohols, you can see we, in, a, in this case, the primary alcohol, we see very little of the M plus peak, but we see quite a bit of the M minus 18 peak. The M minus 18 peak, if you see that, you know immediately that you have an alcohol because that means you've lost water. There's also alpha cleavage that can occur. Remember, alpha cleavage is the loss of a function of a group that's close to where your functional group is. So identifying these fragmentation patterns takes practice. Let's have a look. So for example, we look at the nitrogen rule. If your species has an odd number of nitrogen, then of course we'll have an odd number for our m over z mass units. All right. Now in this class we'll be only looking at compounds with only one nitrogen, so we can always forget about those things. So if you see an odd number for your molecular mass, you know you have nitrogen present. Yeah. We can use high resolution mass spec, and you can see in high resolution mass spec, it's quite yeah, easy to deduce the difference between these two guys here, which have similar molecular weights, but if you probe closer with mass spec, you can see the difference. Degrees of unsaturation is quite nice because it will tell you exactly how much degrees of unsaturation is present in compound so you can talk about rings etc etc yeah we can do a few examples like this in class but remind yourself yeah this is something that you did before you find what your parent alkane was yeah remove um, what the hydrocarbon equivalent is and then you have your hydrogen deficiency and then your hydrogen deficiency divided by two will give you your degrees of unsaturation Remind yourself that the halides all are equivalent to one hydrogen. Oxygen being present, you do not count. It's like zero valent, uh, zero hydrogen, and nitrogen is a minus one. For group seven elements, yeah, remember you subtract one for nitrogen you add one and for oxygen there is no need for corrections so let's read that what I said on the last slide so in this case here you can see that that is you add two here yeah so could you calculate those for me please
So herein we have this 2,2-dimethylpropane. I want to know what the fragments are. Yeah, you can see here there's a fragment here at 56, I think this is. All right, and then try to figure out where this one is from your, from your PDF. You can see that 57 peak is due to the third butyl. Very, very stable calvectide. You realize that. So this is a fragmentation right here. What about this one? Yeah, you can see that this is 2 methyl pentan 3 all. I want you to pause and review this on your slides and then we get back to it. You can see that really we haven't seen the loss of water, but we can see quite a bit of alpha cleavage here and here to give us peaks at 59 and 73. So remind yourself, nitrogen rule, higher resolution spectroscopy, and degrees of aceration. What about this one? It's a very interesting species. But of course, you can do this by the molecular ion and then think about what appears here and here. That's important to you. So the next time we have a chat, we'll be talking about NMR spectroscopy.